Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. Lately, I have finally gotten around to watching The Expanse, and there's honestly a lot of questions that I now have, and a lot of videos that I want to do on the show. The refresher, belter is the term used to refer to humans that are born in the asteroid belt or on the moons of the outer planets of the solar system. Often laborers who have found themselves caught in the middle of hostilities between Earth and Mars, which in The Expanse's universe is an independent military power. A faction of Belters, known as the Outer Planet Alliance, an entity seen as a terrorist group by Earthlings and other logical people, have spearheaded a movement to fight back against the governments of Earth and Mars and establish the Belt's sovereignty over itself. Of note for our video today is that Belters have altered physiologies due to being raised in space and thus maturing differently due to the low gravity environment. Belters are super tall compared to people born on Earth or Mars, but they also are much thinner and have brittle bones. Due to their weak skeletons, they cannot survive in high gravity environments for extended periods of time, and simply standing up on their own weight in environments like Earth is torturous for belters. Which begs the question, does this make any scientific sense? Well, let's see what NASA has to say about the human body in space. Though I know it's hard to trust an institution whose most celebrated spacefarers drink their own pee, but let's give them a chance, hey? NASA points out that for people traveling from one gravity field to another, the adjustment is very difficult on the human body. Changing gravity affects your spatial awareness, balance, and coordination, and you can get really motion sick from the transition. I mean, I get sick on ski lifts, so I'm not sure that space travel is in my future. However, I am proud to remain on Earth as the first, or fourth, or 259th line of defense against the invading Xeno scum. Anyway though, what about gravity fields as far as people raised in space goes? Well, the human body, as far as its muscles and bones go, is somewhat evolved to survive in Earth's gravity. And without gravity or in low gravity, bones lose minerals at a much higher rate. According to NASA, old people on Earth experience bone loss at a rate of 1 to 1.5% per year, while humans in space can see their bone density drop at more than 1% per month. In other words, living in space speeds up the human biological clock. Along with the bone deterioration, in lighter or gravityless environments, human cardiovascular health deteriorates as well because it takes less effort to move. This is why astronauts exercise frequently. Two hours a day, as Mark Shellhammer, chief scientist at NASA's Human Research Program, told Gizmodo back in 2015. They use bungee cords to strap themselves to treadmills and have some sort of quote-unquote advanced resistive exercise device they use for weight training. All this exercise keeps their bone and heart health from slipping drastically. Additionally, humans need to eat very intelligently in space. They can't be nutrient deficient in their meals when every nutrient counts. In other words, humans need to work extra hard and take every precaution in order to stay healthy in space. NASA astronaut Garrett Reisman was on Joe Rogan's podcast the other day, and he pointed out that bone deterioration and other health risks are why astronauts' shifts in space are usually limited to less than 100 days. For the record, the belters in the expanse often take muscle growth and bone density hormones, if they can get their hands on slash afford them, in order to survive in their environment. Another obstacle humans face in space is fluid shifting to the head. Aside from resulting in a puffy face, this can also lead to undue pressure on the eyes and vision problems, kidney stones due to dehydration, and increased excretion of calcium from one's bones. NASA actually has research printed on their website that studies fluid shifts in the body after prolonged spaceflight. As they state, quote, more than half of American astronauts experience vision changes and anatomical alterations to parts of their eyes during and after long duration spaceflight. It is hypothesized that the headward fluid shift that occurs during space flights leads to increased pressure in the brain, which may push on the back of the eye, causing it to change shape, end quote. In March 2016, Scott Kelly broke the record for the longest continuous period spent in space by an American astronaut when he and Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko finished their 340-day mission aboard the International Space Station. NASA's website has an entire section on the mission, the research they conducted, and the knowledge they gained. I highly suggest you search Google for NASA one-year mission and check out the information that they've made available. Prior to the mission, NASA provided a chart detailing their plans for the mission and what they expected to happen to Scott Kelly's body in space. 
They predicted he would exercise more than 700 hours. The amount of fluid that would shift from his legs to his head would be roughly equivalent to a two liter bottle of soda. He would drink about 730 liters of recycled urine and sweat, and he would produce 180 pounds of poop that would burn up in the atmosphere and turn into shooting stars. NASA also points out that your poop will never be shooting stars. F you, NASA. I'll show you. Following his return to Earth, NASA provided a more detailed chart with conclusions from various medical doctors and scientists that explain what happened to Kelly during the course of the mission. First, Scott Kelly's body mass decreased, meaning that despite the exercise, he did lose bone and muscle mass. But on the flip side, as retired NASA astronaut Jeff Williams told CNN at the time, Kelly grew two inches while in space as without the weight of gravity holding him down, his spine elongated. However, an astronaut's height will return to normal after returning to Earth's gravity. So while his body mass decreased on the ISS, Kelly's folate status increased. According to the Mayonnaise Clinic, folate is a B vitamin that is vital in red blood cell formation and for healthy cell growth and function. Kelly's carotid artery wall also thickened. The carotid arteries are major blood vessels in the neck that according to WebMD supply blood to the brain, neck, and face. Kelly also had a high diversity of gut bacteria during the entirety of the mission, meaning that microbiome health can be maintained in space. As for his DNA, Kelly's gene expression changed in space, but the majority returned to normal following the mission. DNA damage was observed and was consistent with radiation exposure. Also, Kelly's telomeres lengthened in space, but reverted to normal on return to Earth. Telomeres, according to yourgenome.org, are sections of DNA that cap the end of chromosomes and provide various vital functions, such as preventing chromosomes from deteriorating. As for his brain, most of Kelly's cognitive functions were unchanged. Finally, Scott's bodily fluid shifted to his upper body and he had structural changes to his eyes. I'm pretty sure that means he had pee in his head, but I'm no expert. In all, what I'm quickly beginning to discover is that the secret to space exploration and by extension the secrets of the universe is P. P is the answer to everything. So what is NASA doing in order to combat the harmful effects that space has on the human body so that humans can in the future travel in space for longer? Well, as Mark Shellhammer points out, no great answer is going to come until scientists invent some sort of artificial gravity technology, which researchers are working on, including a team at the University of Colorado Boulder, which hopes its work will one day allow astronauts to stay in space for longer and travel farther from Earth. For now though, aside from the diet and exercise regimes we've discussed, NASA has to monitor its astronauts pre, during, and after missions very closely. They test everything from motor skills to bodily fluid distribution to pee and so on to make sure their astronauts are healthy. NASA astronauts also wear compression cuffs on their thighs that help keep blood from leaving their lower limbs and thus assist in avoiding negative effects on the eyes. Additionally, NASA is studying the effects of various drugs on combating the negative health effects experienced in space. Aside from the effects of space on human bones and cardiovascular health, we also have to discuss radiation because well, it's also a huge threat for humans traveling through space. As NASA predicts, during the course of Scott Kelly's mission on the International Space Station, he experienced the same amount of exposure to radiation as someone flying on a plane from Los Angeles to New York 5,250 times. Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere protects humans from the dangerous radiation of space. The International Space Station sits just barely within the Earth's magnetic field, and so while Scott Kelly and other astronauts aboard the ISS are exposed to over 10 times the radiation that people on Earth are, they are still much more protected than if they were, say, on a mission to Mars. According to NASA, in deep space, humans would be exposed to much more dangerous radiation, such as ultraviolet radiation from the sun and galactic cosmic rays. As NASA describes, galactic cosmic rays are, quote, high energy ions of elements that have had all their electrons stripped away as they journeyed through the galaxy at nearly the speed of light. These rays can pass through objects such as spacecrafts and skin virtually unimpeded. Of course, exposure to even much less dangerous forms of radiation for prolonged periods of time can cause serious damage to one's central nervous system and of course cause illness such as cancer. Humans traveling through or living in space as we see in the expanse would need shielding around their habitats and ships in order to be able to survive. Somehow Matt Damon was just fine on Mars, despite the planet having no ozone layer and being exposed to dangerous UV rays. Matt Damon should have died fairly quickly in that movie, but 
He met Damon the crap out of it, and so he didn't. Tom Cruise could probably live. Finally, we have to discuss bugs. When we see human civilizations in space, as in The Expanse, one thing not often documented is the bacteria and viruses people would be subject to far from Earth. Scientists have been sending bacteria to space to be cultured for decades, and much of the time the bacteria actually get stronger and more deadly in space, though results vary from pathogen to pathogen. And as NASA explains, the human immune system becomes confused during spaceflight and might not generate appropriate responses to threats. Though I suppose it might turn out that human bacteria in space will just kick the crap out of alien races, so I don't know, maybe we can use it as a weapon, but that's kind of planning is for another video. Okay, we could go on for a while here, as there's a lot to consider in terms of the effects of space travel on humans and the human body. When it comes to the expanse and belters, though, the show's writers generally have the right idea. People living for long periods in space would probably be taller, thinner, and more frail than humans on Earth. But as of now, I'm just not sure it's realistic that such people could survive at all. That said, obviously the fictional technology and medicine in the show helps to explain the science of its universe. Okay, that's the video. Um, if you liked it, please do give it a thumbs up, comment down below. Um, do you like The Expanse? Do you want us to do more videos? I know we've already gotten lots of comments about it, so uh, I'm guessing that this video, or at least topics that relate to The Expanse, will make at least some of you happy. But let me know in the comments below. Um, subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet. Hit that notification bell. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.